Great. So uh, back again. So uh, I'm seeing that we have all the major players in. Just checking that uh, we have Aisha, we have Antonios, uh, we have Maryam, uh, we have uh, Talafha, and uh, we don't have yet Selma. Uh, Selma, she will be uh, our uh, one, two, three, four, our fifth speaker. السلام عليكم دكتور حميد. كم سلام دكتور الياس صباح الخير. كيف اخباركم كيف الصحه؟ كيف الاحوال مرحبا. الحمد لله مستعدين ان شاء الله. والله جاهزين ان شاء الله. ان شاء الله بضع دقائق وسوف نبدا ان شاء الله. ايه توكل على الله. احنا خايفين ان يكون العدد كبير يعني فلهذا سوينا كذلك لايف في اليوتيوب. اذا ما استطعنا. ما استطيعوا يدخلوا في المايكروسوفت تيم يعني في طلاب وفي جمهور ان شاء الله فالبث كذلك موجود لايف على اليوتيوب ممتاز ممتاز يكون احسن بالكثير ان شاء الله يعني ان شاء الله بعون الله المهم يعني كل المتكلمين موجودين الان لايف الان 14 واحد داخل نعم بيرسي. نعم والاساس موجودين انت ما شاء الله والباقي المتكلمين موجودين يعني جيد جيد نعم انا المفروض الان عندي عندي حصه عندي فلك يعني فطاز من طلاب ب 67 طالب لكي يلتحقوا بال بالنشاط هذا يعني كتكلفه للباقي يعني جيد تمام انا اقول لك اتندنس اي اوكي الو السلام عليكم خير ان شاء
In one minute, we're going to start, inshallah. So uh, thank you again for being with us. So the number is getting uh, or the uh, is getting populated. So we're getting the number higher and higher. We have to start sharp because Professor Hamid has uh, some very important appointments later on. Okay, uh, let us start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us in this uh, celebration of the International Asteroid Day uh, 2020. This is the third year that we are participating in this worldwide program. Uh, we have a very rich program for you, and hopefully you are going to benefit. And also at the end, we have a beautiful contest, and you may you may win a, uh, a small telescope. So this is very serious. So please uh, participate and also follow the uh, different lectures. Uh, I would like personally to thank uh, Professor Hamid Nuaimi, uh, uh, the Chancellor of the University of Sharjah, and also the Director of the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space, Science, and Technology for being with us. He kindly accepted to give us uh, the opening ceremony uh, uh, awards for this occasion. Uh, so he, ha he has a very busy schedule today, so I will not uh, uh, let him wait for that. So please, Professor Hamid, you are welcome uh, for your uh, opening ceremony talk. Further. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Dr. Elias, for the small introductory regarding this important event. My colleagues, researchers, scientists, astronomers at Sharjah Academy of Astronomy and Space Sciences and Technology, all faculty, administrative staff, and students at the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences, and Technology, and distinguished guests, and participants. بالإضافة إلى أسرة جامعة الشارقة. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this virtual celebration of International Asteroid Day 2020. Asteroid الكويكبات الصغيرة أو النجيمات التي أغلبها التي تنحصر بين المشتري والمريخ. This event organized by the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy and Space Sciences and Technology, SAST. Well, on behalf of all of you and on behalf of my colleagues in the University of Sharjah and myself, I would like to extend sincere gratitude and appreciation to His Highness Sheikh Dr. Sultan Mohammed Al Qasimi, member of the Supreme Council, ruler of Sharjah, and president of the University of Sharjah for his continuous support for the university and the academy and the and his personal interest in this area of the sciences well today uh, space debris space debris al ashla al fadaiya aw al hatam al fadai whether natural or human made has become a significant concern for the whole human uh, and its survivor Natural debris in our solar system, such as asteroids, meteorites, comets, uh, etc., uh, well, numbers and billions. Aside from the asteroid loca uh, located between Mars and Jupiter, Jupiter, of course, is the largest planet in the solar system. In the asteroid belt, most asteroids are 
unaccounted for and are difficult to detect. In light of the year 1908, Tunguska event, this is a very famous, famous event, during which a space meteorite of nearly 200 meters, the, the, the length, inside explode, exploded just five, five to 10 kilometers above Earth's surface, causing a devastation of tens of million trees, Several scientific scholars have sounded the alarm regarding the threats of asteroid to mankind. The, the celebrated cosmological, the famous uh, Stephen Hawkins was among those who called attention to the problem of asteroids. In 2014, a declaration was signed by more than 200 scientists and culture figures calling upon the United Nations to adopt June 30th, like this day, as International Asteroid Day in order to draw the world's attention to threat possessed by asteroids, which the United Nations declared in 2016. <laughs> هذه الصخور المنتشرة بين المريخ والمشتري التي تتصادم مع بعض ثم بعضها يدخل الغلاف الجوي الأرضي أغلبها تحترق وبعضها تنزل إلى الأرض على شكل نيازك. The main objective of the International Asteroid Day are to raise public awareness regarding the potential hazards of asteroids, save the Earth from asteroids and increase the asteroid discovery rate to 100,000 per year, as compared to, to, to a couple of hundreds per year. The target is to try to reach about 100,000 or more of the asteroids, which are the ones that are going to reach the world. Of course, we can achieve these goals by using the technology to detect and, and track near-Earth asteroids, and e, in EAS, that's threaten human population. This will accelerate the discovery and tracking of the near-Earth asteroids by the hundreds of spots. Well, here at the University of Sharjah, the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy and Space Sciences and Technology established by His Highness Sheikh Dr. Sultan Mohammed al Qazimi, the president of the university. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the academy has constructed a, a, a unique system of three, of three towers to observe space debris. Called the UAE Meteor Monitoring Network, UAE MMN. Well, of course, by the support of UAE Space Agency, with many thanks to them. The system is intended to detect natural space debris, such as meteors or human-made space debris, such as satellites. Each of the three towers is equipped with 17 cameras. The three towers are located in three different locations in United Arab Emirates, in Sharjah, and in, 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 in Sast, Al Ain, and Liwa, to cover the entire UAE uh, airspace. The meteors are detected through different types of sensitive cameras, such as six millimeter, eight millimeter, and uh, fish eyes or fish eyes lens. The camera can identify debris entering the Earth's atmosphere, atmosphere to determine whether any debris possess a threat. The UAE MMN system consists of a prominent role in UAE Space Agency, uh, space, uh, agency space Situation Awareness Program. Well, uh, SAST, or the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology, has become a primary hub for all space science research in the United Arab Emirates, in particular, and in the Middle East in general. 
high school and university students now have a unique opportunity to witness the importance of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, well, what we call it STAM, in all space sciences fields, through similar research laboratories and centers at the academy. In addition to the meteorite center, of course, with the meteorite center, we have a unique exhibition for, for, for meteorites, which is, I think, the largest and the uh, unique uh, collection of, of uh, Niazik. Uh, the academy is also operating five other laboratories, centers. First, the radio astronomy laboratory is operating at 20.1 megahertz uh, decametric radio array for observation of the Sun and Jupiter. It has recently installed a 40 meter radio interferometer to observe the, the universe at 1.4 gigahertz. The second, the Academy hosts a GIS and remote sensing uh, center uh, in a close collaboration between the two colleges, College of Science and College of Engineering in the University. In the University of Georgia, the collaboration between SAS and the University regarding this the, the, the unique radio observatory. The third laboratory is the Space Weather and Ionospheric Laboratory, hosting two central systems, the GNSS and uh, CADI. I know so they, they, these instrumentation are famous internationally. Uh, Ionosphere system to study the Earth, the, the Earth upper ionosphere. The fourth laboratory is the CubeSat Laboratory where students are developing the ChargeSat-1, uh, an X-ray CubeSat to observe the sun and the stars in X-ray domain. Well, inshallah, we will launch it the beginning of next year. Last, the High Energy Astro Astrophysical Laboratory is the tactic to compact stellar objects such as white dwarf, neutron star, and black holes. Uh, above all, we have as well in the academy uh, the Astronomical Optical Observatory, equipped with a 45 centimeter telescope for deep sky observation and 18, uh, 18 centimeter telescope for observation of planets and the moon and a 10 centimeter solar telescope. Recently, a 14 inch telescope was added to become part of a new Charger Lunar Impact Observatory in order to observe meteorite as they impact the moon moon surface. And my colleagues in the SAS already they did. They detect and they observe uh, such kinds of impacts. Finally, it is important to mention that this is a third year that the Academy has organized this special asteroid day, June 30. Similar events were undertaken in 2018 and 2019 to promote space science among youth in UAE. The UAE is currently investing more than 22 billion dirhams in space exploration. And the Academy has built an important strategic partnership with the UAE Space Agency and this exciting space venture. Well, uh, once again, I would like to express sincere appreciation and gratitude to His Highness Sheikh Dr. Sultan Mohammed Al Qasimi, member of the Supreme Council, ruler of Sharjah, and the president of the University of Sharjah for, for his unlimited support for the university, academy, and enthusiasm for the field of astronomy and space sciences. I would further like to convey deep appreciation to all my colleagues working at SAST, Sharjah Academy for Astronomy and Space Sciences, who have organized this event, wishing you all continuous, uh, continuous success. Barakallah bikum wa shukran jazeelan wa salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamid, uh, for this uh, very beautiful uh, talk. But we need also to thank you because if it were not for your leadership, for wise uh, advice that, uh, about the, uh, the academy, we won't be here. I believe uh, we have to thank you because, as we say in Arabic, 
We have to thank you for your great work. I believe if it weren't for your great support, we always come to your office asking for something and you never refuse what we were asking. So thank you very much uh, for being the director of the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Science and Technology. And hopefully we have a very bright future uh, with your leadership. Thank you. And thank, you again. thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking forward, if you have any, any recommendation uh, after, after this uh, important uh, meeting. Thank you. For sure, we'll do, we'll do, inshallah. Thank you very much, Professor Hamid. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Okay, so let us uh, continue on our uh, program. So we have a series of lectures. We have uh, uh, six lectures uh, uh, to talk about uh, the uh, academe as a whole and also about, uh, about our special program, which is, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the UAE MMN and also what we are doing in uh, observing this space debris as Professor Hamid was talking. Uh, so uh, I have the first lecture, so let me start, let me share uh, my screen uh, with you, and hopefully everything will go fine. So let me find my, uh, uh, let me find my talk, where is it? I am seeing my, uh, okay, here it is. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. So let me time myself. So I have 15 minutes to talk about what I am going to talk. So uh, uh, SAS Research Laboratories. This talk is uh, for SAS uh, Research Assistant, also for all those people who are joining us right now, especially uh, especially uh, students. Uh, so who we are and also what we do. Uh, so we have a very nice uh, building that you saw just a few seconds. This is a very nice building. This is uh, the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Science and Technology. The Gordel Dome is a beautiful planetarium uh, directed by Mr. Marwan Shweki. Uh, so uh, the first floor is all space exhibitions and the ground floor are all research labs. So let me, uh, let me start. So uh, I will talk briefly about uh, the University of Sharjah, the Department of, of Applied Physics and Astronomy, and also our academy. Then I'll talk about the, the SAS organigram, the research labs, and so on and so on. So in terms, so we are part of the, of the University of Sharjah. Uh, we are six astronomers in this department. We have, mashallah, 45 students. And presently, we have five undergraduate astronomy courses, uh, which is quite great. Uh, in terms of SAS, we are 15 research assistants. We have eight space science laboratories and also three, three observatories. Uh, in, in terms of research, so we are well qualified in space sciences, astronomy, remote sensing, and hopefully in the near future, artificial intelligence applied to astronomy. Uh, in terms of academic, uh, thanks to God. So this coming fall, we're going to have our MSc in astronomy space sciences. It is, it is a dream. Uh, it was a dream, but now it is a reality. Uh, also, uh, hopefully, we're going to host this MSc room sensing, and hopefully by next year, this MSc in aerospace engineering. In terms of SAS organigram, so we have different units, uh, the academic affairs, the research affairs, the community outreach affairs, the admin, and also the ITC. So uh, this information is just general. In terms of the research laboratories, uh, so let me talk about them. So I have several ones, so we're able to build a CubeSat lab. Uh, a meteorite center, a space weather lab, a radio astronomy lab, an astrophysics lab, high energy astrophysics lab. Uh, we have the charge optical observatory and also, also we have this new baby, the charge lunar impact uh, observatory. Uh, in terms of the project that do belong to this lab, so we have the UI meteor monitoring network that Professor Hamid was talking about. Three towers, one in Sharjah here at SAS, one in Liwa, one in Al Ain. Uh, for the uh, space weather, we have uh, two uh, instruments. We have this INOSON to study the upper atmosphere, uh, what does the solar wind do to it. And also we have this GNSS uh, uh, station just at the top of our optical observatory. Uh, we have also part of the uh, radio astronomy lab. We have this decametic radio telescope, uh, very simple dipoles. Uh, we have two systems, one uh, we, we, we use for the sun and Jupiter and one only for the sun when the sun is quite high. This was at 20.1 megahertz and this past June, beginning of June, we were able to detect a beautiful solar, uh, solar radio burst. 
uh, we just finished building this 40 meter radio interferometer. It has uh, three telescopes. Each one is about five meter. Uh, and hopefully when it is operational, it will be working at 1.4 gigahertz. And we have a plan to extend it to at least to add six more radio telescope to have a baseline as big as about 400 kilometers. And usually as we say in astronomy, bigger is better. As part of the CubeSat lab, we just finished building this uh, ground station. When we send our Sharjah Sat one, hopefully by quarter one, 2021, we need to communicate with, with, with this. So we are ready. So we have built our own uh, ground station. Uh, also part of the meteor center. So we do, uh, uh, once we detect the meteors, if it does fall, so we have a meteorite. So we need to search for it. So we have this machine learning unit beside the drone unit to look for it. Uh, also, we do meteorite analysis and Selma is going to talk about it in a few minutes. So we uh, get uh, stones from people here and there and we need to do the analysis. Are the meteorites or not? So we have that capability here. In Professor, yeah, we are unable. Out, to I think uh, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Now we can, I guess. No, no, no. Uh, Doctor Lias, you are mute. Okay. Uh, when, 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 when I was mute, tell me which slide. Before, before. Can you go back? Yeah, back. I go back. I will go back. So tell me when I, I was mute. I apologize for that. Maybe I pushed something, maybe whatever. So do you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we do. Just before so, the table. So where I was mute? Here? Just before the table. Table, yes. Here. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay, sorry. I don't know what happened. Maybe a virus, whatever. Okay, so uh, this is part of the uh, meteorite center. So we do a uh, search, we observe these meteors. If they do fall, we call them meteorites. So we have a unit here, we have a machine learning and also drone unit to look for these meteorites. Uh, also, we have this meteorite analysis unit here. So because uh, uh, we are a meteorite center, people bring us some stones from here and there, we analyze them. We have uh, a small lab here that with this, this instrument that you see microscopes and also an, X, an XRF spectrometer, very, very expensive device. Uh, it, it, it is as expensive as a, uh, as a land cruiser, mashallah, but we have it sitting on the table. So we do this analysis. Plus we have a very advanced lab at the university. In terms of the high energy astrophysics lab, so we have this uh, active galactic nuclei uh, research that I do myself uh, with, uh, and we have also Professor uh, Dr. Antonios that, uh, that does, uh, uh, compact objects, uh, neutron stars, white or black holes, and we have Professor Marshall that does binary stars. So we, ha we are a complete team in terms of doing this work. In terms of funding, so let me show you this. Uh, we are funded by University of Sharjah, by the UE Space Agency, and also by Mohammed Space, Space Center. In terms of publication, uh, since I lost the voice, doctor. I lost the voice. Yes, doctor. You mute again. Yeah, now I hear you. No way does it does it cross. So I need to maybe we need to talk to whatever. Okay. So uh you hear my voice again? Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, publication. So something something is going on for my voice. I'm sorry. Publication, so we we are well because if you don't publish, if you don't publish, you don't get budget. Period. Yeah, as we as usually we say, if you don't publish P, you perish. You perish P also. Okay, so uh, in terms of activities, so we I believe all of you know that we have done tens 
of workshops, lectures, and so on, open houses. So we are very active. Uh, this pandemic came and it did break us a little bit, but that's fine. In terms of the academics, uh, so we are going to have uh, uh, this coming fall, uh, a new MSc in astronomy and space sciences. Uh, hopefully next year, the MSc in aerospace engineering, we're going to host it. And also this MSc in GIS remote sensing that you will open also uh, this coming uh, this coming semester. In terms of inter international, I believe we have good collaboration from here and there. Uh, Germany, England, uh, we have also this CAM, CAM3 net, uh, which is a neutrino, uh, neutrino observatory. So we are a member, we, have, we are now an observer and hopefully we're going to become a full member. This intranet with Professor Remo Ruffini that you, you, you that did business last year. And also with Sharjah Assad, we have this Istanbul Technical University. So we are, uh, we have this international status, thanks to God. In terms of future, uh, future SAS projects, so we are, uh, uh, we are shooting for to have a, our own data center, our own machine shop, uh, an artificial intelligence lab, a balloon and suborbital rocket laboratory. We have the proposal from the Swedish, but it has not been activated because of the pandemic. Uh, we have in mind to have this astronaut training center that was proposed by some of you, and also to have a robotic laboratory. So uh, this is this is not our future because if we don't if we don't renew ourselves. Uh, we'll die. So we have to renew, we have to add more, more projects and so on. And I take this occasion to thank all the staff, all the staff, uh, all the staff, because uh, because if it weren't for you, for your hard, for your hard work, we won't be a business. Because as usually I always say, uh, we are a unique center, a unique academy in the MENA world, Middle East and North Africa. Summary, this is, all what we are able to achieve, great, very important for our own survival. And at the end, thank you very much. Okay, so this is uh, my part. If you have, uh, if someone has a question, so please, uh, please uh, can ask if you want one or two questions. We can also, we are on time, so we are 10.30, I believe my time is fine. Uh, also, please for the uh, for the attendee, please do not do not press the mute uh, the mute button for all. If you do it, you are going to close me. You're going to shut me off. And this, I believe, this is what happened. Any questions, uh, Doctor Elias? Can I ask you uh, just please. talking? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Mohammed Talafa. Just about yes. uh, our MSc. Maybe uh, we have uh, some uh, student. They need some information, quick information to know uh, about uh, our MSc in uh, astronomy. We yes. have uh, this uh, uh, time. Yes. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yes, please. For those people who are very interested in our MSc, uh, on our new website, uh, www.saast.ee, uh, there is a section about the MSc, and all the information is there. So check where SAT. Uh, SAS website and you have that information. You can also go into the university website and you find the same information. So the information is available uh, on the university website and also in our website in great details. Any more questions? Professor, one question. Please. Yeah, uh, how do astronomy and uh, these observatory centers add an economic value to the society? How do observatories add to the economic value? Well, you know, science, yes. science is part of a society. Doing science, doing research, inviting students, as Professor Hamid said in that STEM is very important. So being engaged in science, being engaged in uh, any type of science, being uh, space sciences or being uh, being a biologist, being uh, uh, a chemist or being an engineering, all of these parts it is just to enrich the society. So it adds value to the society as a whole. You cannot just practice engineering by itself, forgetting science. And you, can, you cannot just practice science, forgetting engineering. They're all, all together. This is how we build the society. So it will add value to everything. 
uh, to the status of the uh, of the of the society uh, from the cultural point of view, uh, from the economical point of view, and also and also most importantly from the knowledge point of view. Okay, so Thank let me that. stop here with the questions, and it is time to go to keep uh, to keep track on time. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Antonios Manusakis uh, to give us his lecture. What are space debris? Dr. Antonios, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, a beautiful one. Let me start uh, to make it full screen. Can you see it as a full screen now? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to speak about uh, to speak about space debris. Uh, first of all, I will start a bit with uh, with a history in uh, in language. First of all, the word debris is coming from a French word, uh, and it means something that is breaking apart, something that it is actually breaking. Uh, Actually, I didn't include it in my slides because I noticed it only early this morning, but the word debris start to increase in frequency uh, when we use it around 50s, shortly before 50s, but around 50s, and then it keep expanding. And it's not in coincidence uh, uh, with uh, the space race that started around with the Sputnik around, uh, around 57. Uh, 1957. So, what is space debris? First of all, debris is something that we don't want to have it. If you ever been in a very crowded airport like Dubai Airport, Amsterdam Airport, or Heathrow Airport, uh, frequently you are going to see uh, that you are having uh, that you are having uh, cars that are running on the runway uh, to search for foreign objects. Foreign objects in general in places like runways are dangerous. Uh, so in very frequently airports, we are going to see that. But this is a word general about debris. Let's speak about space debris. What is it? Uh, here we're going to mainly to concentrate on man-made uh, space debris as Professor Hamid mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, these are unwanted junk, another word, for space debris is space junk uh, that are accumulated over years in space. Uh, so indeed, artificial rubbish are orbiting the gravitational potential of the Earth. Uh, these can be either obsolete satellites that they are performed their task, they will stay there, and then they became eventually space debris. Uh, it can be a broken piece from a telescope, a space telescope, a broken piece of uh, a probe or a satellite in general, as we are going to see uh, later. The size of this space debris is rather small. You cannot easily track it from the Earth. If it is slightly larger, that it's reasonably easy to track it from the Earth. So the space debris are small parts, roughly one centimeter or larger. Some space debris are a few tens of centimeters, but the vast majority of the space debris are roughly, and those that they are most potentially hazard, are roughly the size of a postage, uh, of a postage uh, stamp. Uh, a few centimeters by a few centimeters, moving at an extreme speed up to 10 kilometers per second. So if you can get if you can get a feeling on that, imagine that you want to travel from Sharjah to the university and you do that in one second and not in one hour that our common sense implies, right? So uh, the problem, where is the problem and why we need to have space awareness? First of all, currently space is running out of space. It, found, it sounds funny, but it is true. As you can see in the video that it was provided by our colleagues uh, at AGI, uh, they use a software, uh, they use a software SDK to, to map uh, the 
how many objects per million cubic kilometers we have into space as a function of time. And we can see that this, it started back in 2007 and extends up to 2014, I think. And we can see that like a blanket is covering our skies. Most of you might be more familiar with uh, the, const uh, the, the Starling constellation of SpaceX. These are actually not space debris because these satellites are operational, uh, but eventually these satellites will be obsolete in the future. So eventually they will become space debris. So we need to have a policy. We need a traffic, a, a police, a traffic control. Like in the space, in the airspace above UAE, we have the UAE, the UAE air traffic control system, uh, the instrument flight rule regime of the UAE. We need to have regulations onto the space in order to minimize the effect of space debris. Uh, if we have collisions, that we have collisions in space, uh, space, dub, space debris will increase in the future. Uh, one remarkable collision that you might remember happened uh, back in 2009 between a US satellite, Iridium-33, and Cosmos 2251, which is a Russian uh, satellite. What are these satellites? Iridium satellites are part of the Iridium constellation. It's a reasonably large satellite, half a ton, and it's mainly communication satellite. Cosmos 2251 is a metric ton satellite, military communication satellite, so they, they collide. So initially you have one actually operational satellite, Iridium-1 decommissioned satellite, Cosmos 2251, crash together, and then you have a number of space debris. And you can see actually these two space debris in the two following frames. Unfortunately, I cannot introduce, I, I was not able to introduce the video, but it's better like that for online. Uh, and we can see the space debris mapping 25 minutes after the collision and 50 minutes after the collision. Now these space debris are still there. Some of them, of course, of course will come uh, down to the Earth due to the gravity of the Earth, but most of them, they will remain in space. Another unfortunate event that happened uh, was the sad story of Astro-8, uh, a Japanese aerospace exploration agency X-ray satellite uh, named Hitomi. Uh, this satellite was launched back in 2016, so in February, mid-February, and it is an X-ray observatory with a state-of-the-art detector, unprecedented accuracy and really amazing capabilities. However, during a maneuver, uh, this uh, uh, satellite uh, lost completely the attitude control. There was an attitude control failure and this satellite entered an uncontrolled spin. So it was tumbling around its three axes in an uncontrolled way. And of course, as people you can guess, if something is spinning and spinning uncontrollably, you in create a lot of angular momentum and the weakest link will start to break. So this satellite, was breaking apart into four major pieces. And the four major pieces, as you can guess, are mainly the solar panels, the extendable boom with the detector, and the main piece of the instrument. These are rather large space debris, but still, it's another such story that you can actually see that space debris are common in space. It's not uncommon. Uh, in this case, I would like to introduce a software that it is actually available online, Celestrack, that you can actually map, not space debris, but everything, so operational satellites, non-operational satellites, and smaller objects that are currently orbiting around the Earth. Uh, and of course, if you increase the speed that the time is passing, you can see the effects of these uh, space debris. Uh, around. So you might have a look on, on that. Space debris, are they dangerous? Short answer, yes. Long answer, I leave it to you to read it. 
but we're going to see some examples. Potentially, they can create hazard. Uh, they can puncture holes, uh, these space debris, on the skin of uh, artificial satellites. In this case, we have the Endeavour, the space shuttle, Endeavour and Discovery. Here we can see a hole in the skin of Endeavour made by, uh, made by a space debris. On the bottom of... No. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see that, yes. Okay. yes. Also, yes. Because the, the MS Teams windows pop up. So yeah, I will continue. So we can see these tiles that are actually punctuated by something much, much smaller than space debris, which is micrometeoroids. Micrometeoroids, uh, I don't know if they're going to discuss it later, are very, very small, a fraction, a tiny fraction of a, of a gram that is moving in space. And these are also potential, potentially hazardous. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you have all seen, uh, you have all seen uh, very nice pictures from ISS, from the, uh, from the canopy of ISS named Cupola. However, the thing that you don't know is that Cupola is always covered if it is not used in order to protect it from space debris. You can see on the right hand side, you can see these thick panels that are placed exactly above the windows of cupola in order to protect it from the space debris, not to create any potential hazard. What is the current plans to remove and minimize the effects of space debris? First of all, with the current laws, uh, certain satellites at certain orbits require, uh, the, the laws are requiring that you should have a deorbiting mechanism. If the satellite is large enough or is it in the uh, higher orbit, it requires to have a deorbiting mechanism uh, in order to remove it from the space. Smaller satellites, uh, they don't require that, especially low Earth orbits, much smaller satellites, eventually there is enough drag and within 10, 20 years uh, of a lifetime in the lower, in the lower uh, Earth orbit, eventually we lose momentum and will fall onto the ground. However, satellites that are not deorbited, they have to be removed. Uh, one plan, one proposal is uh, uh, between the European Space Agency and the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, the Polytechnic School of uh, Lausanne, uh, they have proposed a clear space one satellite that is actually, it's like a spider, that it will go and hug a relatively large, a relatively large satellite, will grab it, and then you have a deorbiting mechanism to remove it, especially older satellites that they are not equipped with uh, that they are not equipped uh, with the orbiting uh, mechanism. So, coming to an end, uh, what is a take-home note or a summary, if you wish? The most important, space is running out of space. It sounds awkward, but it is true. It becomes more and more congested. Imagine Sarja Roads 40 years ago, you can travel the distance between Sarja and the place that the university is right now, maybe in 10 minutes or five minutes, or during COVID times, you can travel this distance in 10 minutes, but during normal uh, days, you need an hour to travel. It's exactly the same in space. Uh, so we need to take care of that. Space debris is dangerous for uh, the current satellites that are in orbit, the International Space Station that you have also human beings there, and especially for extra vehicular activities of the astronauts. More satellites are going there. We have already one satellite plan to go there in the next year, as Dr. Elias mentioned earlier, our own SARS-ASAT. Uh, eventually, after successful operations for 
Normally, you plan the satellites for three years, but you can extend it to way more. So we expect to have a fully operational satellite and will never become a space debris until eventually lose a lot of angular momentum and retaining in the Earth within 10 years. Uh, but other satellites, they finish their lifetime, their lifespan, and eventually they become space debris. And collisions between satellites are inevitable, creating more and more space debris. And at that time, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I have a last question uh, in this uh, in this, uh, in this session uh, regarding our own academy. In our own academy, if you have ever visited, you have seen the cosmic park uh, that you have, uh, the solar system and the planetarium at the middle represent uh, the sun. Uh, my question here is, do we have any debris in the cosmic park? And I leave it for you to answer it later on. Hopefully by the end of the presentation, we can discuss that. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions, Dr. Elias, I don't know if I have time. So according to my timer, I have one minute. Uh, but if you have time, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Antonio. So you are on time 100%. So please, uh, if you have one or two questions, uh, please go ahead. Um, can I ask a question? Please. Okay, so how much does do space debris, uh, how much do space debris uh, affect most uh, space agencies uh, every year? Uh, there are not many encounters with existing satellites, uh, major encounters that they, 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 they go to a complete failure. But for instance, I know uh, from my own experience that uh, several X-ray satellites that are, that is my main field of speciality. Uh, these uh, satellites are degraded, and we lose parts of the instrument because you have either micrometeoroids or tiny space debris that they hitting the radiator of the detector on part of the detector and make it uh, inactive. Uh, so I don't have a feeling on how may, how many encounters per year we have. Uh, but over the, uh, and especially major that they will end up on, uh, uh, they will end up on uh, completely failure of the satellite, but smaller events, minor events that you degrade specific instruments or solar panel on MIR, we actually have it. It's something that we know it already, even uh, 30 years ago when MIR uh, went into space, was into space. I hope I answer your question. Uh, one more question. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, are, is space debris or all the unnatural artificial stuff that we send and that has has become hazardous or it also consists of the natural stuff that is hazardous to the current satellites? Well, I mean, uh, in this case, if a satellite is operational, you cannot really call it space debris because it is operational. After the end of the lifetime and when you shut down the satellite or you put it in a service mode, uh, then it becomes a potential space debris. But still, it's difficult to make a distinction if this one is a debris or not. For instance, with a Cosmos and Iridium collision, these satellites were not space debris before the collision. One satellite was in the service mode. Uh, Iridium satellite was active. The other one was inactive, but still operational in the minimum capacity. So you cannot say that it is space debris. After the collision, of course, both of them, they created a lot of space debris. And space debris are hazardous uh, because they can create potentially collides. They are moving with a very high velocities. Uh, the maximum velocity that they can reach is roughly 10 kilometers per second. So indeed, they can cause some serious trouble. And they're causing troubles. Up to now, minor troubles, but they're causing it. Uh, if I may add something, uh, most uh, most of the uh, space debris that do not come from big satellites, from this geostationary satellite, because there, 36, 37,000 kilometers, uh, there is a, there is an international space law, and and UE is part of it. Uh, any any um, any commercial company that will send a, a satellite, big one, it uh, it has a duty 
when the satellite is off service, maybe after 10, 15 years, to deorbit the satellite to a higher orbit. When it is to a higher orbit, it will stay there forever. The only, the only space that we get is from this uh, LEO, low Earth orbit satellites. Like for example, now we are sending hundreds of CubeSats after a couple of months, couple of, uh, couple of years, they will come, they, they will burn into our own atmosphere, or maybe some of these scientific spacecraft, or uh, scientific uh, uh, space telescope. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Antonio. So uh, thank you for the questions. It is time to move to our third lecturer, uh, Ms. Aisha Louise, part of the Meteorite Center. So Ms. Aisha, please take the stage. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this special event today. Uh, my name is Aisha Louise. I'm a research assistant at the Meteorite Center, and I will be walking you through the different facilities we have at the center. First of all, I'd like to say that the Meteorite Center is a unique center, at least in the Gulf region, due to the different facilities it offers and the different projects it works on. It is also dedicated to building technologies and strategies to detect, identify, and locate meteorites, as well as analyze them. It consists of three different units, the first one being the UAE Meteor Monitoring Network, which is funded by the UAE Space Agency, and also the Machine Learning Unit, which is responsible for retrieving uh, meteorites from the desert, and finally, the Meteorite Analysis Unit. Now, when it comes to our objectives, we encourage interdisciplinary efforts and engage qualified students from the University of Sharjah. We observe meteors and fireballs above the UAE sky using the UAE MMN towers. We also analyze meteorites using cutting edge technologies available at SAST and the University of Sharjah, in addition to developing an AI UAV system that is capable of autonomously surveying an area and uh, detecting uh, meteorites. We also hope to contribute to the UAE's ambitious national space program. For the first unit, the UAE MMN, as mentioned earlier, it consists of three different towers located in different parts of the country. As you can see in the map, we observe and analyze meteors and fireballs using sophisticated uh, programs that provide us also with approximate possible landing uh, locations. We also provide monthly and annual statistics for meteor detection, and this enables us to, con uh, to compare our meteor counts in the UAE with other meteor counts in different parts of the world like uh, Australia and Europe as they have similar systems. Uh, we also, by having this project, take part in the UAE Space Situational Awareness uh, Program. In the picture under the map, you can see uh, a meteor However, my colleagues will present to you much, much nicer uh, meteors and fireballs. And on the right, you can see the tower we have here uh, in Sharjah uh, at the Academy. It's a beautiful one. And then, of course, after determining the possible landing location, uh, here our machine learning unit comes in. So we're aiming to establish an AI algorithm that can sufficiently differentiate between rocks and iron meteorites in specific. Uh, that having that system facilitates the process of meteorite hunting using deep learning techniques. By this system, we contribute to leading edge global research on artificial intelligence for applications in space sciences and astronomy. And you may know that today we are using machine learning or the world is using machine learning to classify galaxies, uh, identify gamma ray bursts, and other cosmic phenomena. Therefore, we are considered to be one of the leading entities to carry on this research. Uh, in the figure above, you can see uh, a bounding box on a meteorite that is saying that it's 94% meteorite, which is accurate. And then to explain this process, we deploy our code on a uh, small computer, as you can see below. This computer is, the, the code is deployed on it, but first we train the code using our data set uh, collection that we have at the academy. And then a camera and a thermal sensor is attached to this mini, mini computer, which is then carried by the drone to scan a given area in the desert. The picture on the right shows um, a, an, the output from the thermal sensor because meteorites, specifically iron meteorites, have iron in them, therefore they preserve heat. And then this is another way to confirm that what we are seeing is actually a meteorite, not a rock. 
However, this is yet not enough um, to tell us or to ensure us that uh, what we are seeing is a meteorite or not. Therefore, we need the meteorite analysis unit. In this unit, we analyze rocks and meteorites using sophisticated instruments such as the scanning electron microscope and as well as the X-ray fluorescence and X-ray diffraction. We conduct research studies on meteorites, including their elemental composition and mineralogy. We also perform tests on samples received from the community. We also engage students with meteorite-related research, especially during their internships. Uh, and by analyzing meteorites, we understand what cosmic phenomena meteorites went through before landing on Earth. And by that, I mean, what kind of inclusions have happened uh, or have taken place in that, meteor in that meteorite before it has entered the Earth's atmosphere. In terms of our publications, we recently published a, a journal, uh, uh, an article in a highly ranked journal. Uh, it's the Journal of uh, Instrumentation. In terms of magazines, we published an article in the Room Space Magazine article. And for conference proceedings, we participated in the International Meteor Conference, as well as the International Conference on Signal Processing and Information Security. This, uh, in this uh, conference, we participated with a machine, uh, machine uh, uh, learning related article. And we also have an ab accepted abstract in, uh, for the COSPAR 2021 uh, conference, which is a big conference that is going to take place in Australia in February 2021. We have also published an e-meteor news, which is considered like um, a hub for everything related uh, to meteor meteors. And finally, we have also conducted a workshop back in October 17, 2019, and we are hoping to uh, conduct similar workshops in the coming future. Um, regarding our participations, we have participated in the International Meteor Conference that took place at the International Meteor Organization in Germany, and we have also participated in the Artificial Intelligence in Astronomy Workshop in, in uh, the European Southern Observatory in Germany back in summer 2019. As for national participations, we have uh, participated, as I mentioned earlier, in the ICSBIS uh, conference in Dubai, also Global Airspace Space Summit, um, and additional conferences, um, events here and there in the UAE. Uh, we're celebrating the asteroid day today to take part in a worldly celebrated astronomical events. In addition to being an active member of the IAU, to also raise awareness about space debris, to engage the public with educational scientific events, to deliver some uh, astronomical information in a simple way that is easy to understand, and also to encourage studies in, astronom in astronomy generally and uh, specifically in planetary science and geology, but not limited to that, because as we have seen, the Meteorite Center itself is composed of many different um, units that welcome uh, all majors in sciences and engineering. Therefore, um, uh, all labs in the academy uh, are open to different majors and uh, interested parties from a different parts of the world. So that was it from my side. I hope uh, now you have a clear idea of what the Meteorite Center consists of. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I leave the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Aisha, for this uh, nice presentation. I believe you give a very good view about the Meteorite Center. Uh, I will uh, open now uh, the floor for questions. Do you have questions? Yes, uh, in one of the slides we have seen the uh, meteorite is, it was written 94% meteorite. So what does that mean? What is the other 6%? I'll answer that question. So we have two classes. It's either meteorite or rock. So 94% actually presents the confidence level how much the system is confident that what it is seeing is a meteorite and not a rock. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, any other question, please? If, if no one has a question, can I add one more? Please. 
I just want to be fair with everyone. Okay, so do we have any precious metals that we can find from the meteoroids? Have we ever done uh, have that instance in the history as well? Precious metals, as in everything that's there in the uh, chemical elements, but nothing outside that table of chemical elements. So usually there are uh, uh, other uh, metals like uh, nickel. But I'm not sure about silver and gold, gold. That is very, very rare. So for now, our main focus is on irons, basically, as it is not uh, present in, um, uh, in rocks. In addition to that, meteors or meteorites, just to clear something out, when they are in the, in, in the sky, we call them meteors. And then when they land, we call them meteorites. So meteorites are considered to be the building blocks of the solar, solar system. And meteorites are actually before entering the Earth's atmosphere, they are called meteoroids, which is a smaller chunk of the asteroid. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions for the for Aisha? Um, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Uh, what exactly is the difference between an asteroid and a meteor? An asteroid, Aisha. an asteroid is the bigger body. And a part of it is the meteoroid with the letter D. And then when that meteoroid, the smaller chunk of the asteroid enters the Earth's atmosphere, we call it a meteor, or as people know it, the uh, sh shooting star. And then when finally, when it lands, we call it a meteorite. So originally, it's part of the asteroid, like they come from asteroids, yes. right? Yes, yes, it is part of the asteroid. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And just to add a few things, this meteorite can also be part of uh, passing comets uh, as they uh, uh, as they lose their mass, uh, their gas, and so on. So it is like a mixture. But uh, as Aisha said, so uh, there's a very big there's a very big difference uh, between the objects. Uh, one last question. One last question, please. Um. Uh, I am the. I hope I'm not bothering you, Ms. Aisha, but I wanted to ask, um, now, right now, the, you have the meteorite, the meteorite center has plans to establish another a fourth tower to cover the sky of the UAE. Do you have any idea where possibly this tower could be located? We are still uh, looking for places to place at least not one tower, actually more than that. For now, we have the uh, Western side not covered yet, which is near uh, neighboring countries. And we also have some of the parts in the South which are not covered yet, and also the North. Therefore, we are uh, hoping to add at least three more towers to cover the whole UAE sky. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aisha, uh, Aisha, for this excellent uh, lecture. And also, uh, thank you for the audience for asking these beautiful questions. OK, we go to uh, lecture number four, so meteorite uh, analysis. I would like to ask Ms. Selma Subhi. Uh, she is part of the uh, research the meteorite center. And she will talk about how we can do this uh, meteorite analysis. Please, uh, Selma, take stage. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to join you today on the Asteroid Day 2020. And I would like to come each one of you. Uh, please let me share my screen. Okay, meteorite analysis. Meteorite analysis window to the past, guide to the future. It's such a wonderful feeling when you hold a meteorite in your hand. You are holding a meteorite or a piece from the outer space. And the most exciting part is when you analyze and discover the science, mystery, and beauty of these rocks. So why do we study and analyze meteorites? We open a window into the history, age, chemical composition, geological processes, and early evolution of our solar system since 4.6 billion years ago. 
We also discover how meteorite impacts and hazards could affect our future. So we raise the awareness about all these. We unlock some of life origin's secrets on Earth because some of them contain water and amino acids. Okay, then how to identify meteorites? I found a meteorite. Some people say this sentence assume, when they find rocks, assuming that they are meteorites. But did they really find meteorites? Well, it's our turn to identify or to find out whether they are meteorites or meteor rocks. We start examining the rocks by using primary tests, such as the street test. We scratch the sample on a ceramic tile and we see and we check also if it leaves a trace or not. The magnetism, if it's attracted to the magnet or not. The weight and density. Most of the meteorites are heavier than the Earth rocks. The fusion crust. The fusion crust is a thin coating layer to was formed when the, meteor, when the rock or the meteor enter the atmosphere and burn up. Also, we are checking the window test. This is very important because the outside will be completely different from the inside. If the rock passed all these primary tests successfully, then it could be a meteorite. Then we will go for the next step for more accurate and detailed analysis by using analytical techniques. Analytical techniques such as XRF, XRD, SEM, and so on. That is to come up with the mineral composition of the rocks. We can see some of the analysis results that we can get from the XRF test here or the XRD, the X-ray diffraction. And here you can see in the table so many here uh, element, uh, elements here that we get from the uh, XRF test. And here the spectrum and the diagram, uh, as I told you, that's to come up with the mineral composition of the rock. Regarding this slide, the result of the um, polarized microscope is a bit different. Really, it's a bit different because here, uh, that's why I put it here on a different slide, because I'd like to show you the beauty that we can't see with our eyes. This is the original rock here, and we cut here a sample. We make a thin section from this rock here. Uh, so here is an example of a thin section of a chondrite meteorite. Uh, a chondrite meteorite is a kind of a stony meteorite and uh, scientists call it like this, you know, because uh, it contains chondrules. Chondrules, as you can see here in the screen, okay, they are small round grains or inclusions. Uh, their size uh, range between um, 100 micrometers to a few millimeters and uh, they were formed as molten drops uh, in, the, in the solar nebula, in the early solar nebula at high temperatures. And uh, as uh, Mary Curie said, I am among those who think that um, science has a great beauty. I am one of them, and maybe you are one of them. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sanma, for this uh, presentation to describe how we do the uh, analysis for the meteorite and how do we recognize uh, a real one from a wrong one. Uh, for the audience, do you have a question about uh, about Sanma talk, please? Uh, yes. Uh, can you please go to the previous slide? Yeah, I already... Okay. You mean this one? This one? Yes. Can you explain all these beautiful colors? Is, is this common in all the meteorites or just this yeah, one? Just, see, I'll tell you something. Regarding the inclusions here or the uh, here, the chondrules, okay, mostly, uh, largely, they are containing, you know, or they contain of uh, silicate minerals, okay, like olivine, pyroxene, and maybe there are also, there are also plagioclase. Um, and here, the, and they are different, you know, from one sample to another. But the, these controls, you cannot find them in all 
in all types of meteorites. Uh, this is just a kind of a stony meteorite, we call it a chondrite. Okay, there is another type, it's uh, carbonaceous chondrite, um, and also there are many types. Carbonaceous chondrite is a kind of stony meteorite. Uh, other types of meteorites, like uh, the iron meteorite, you will not find these chondrules. Okay, it's just iron and nickel, okay, and some other inclusions, okay. Uh, in the, uh, for example, in the stony iron meteorite or the palisite, it's completely different. Okay, you will not find these also chondrules. Uh, you will find something else because it's a combination between stone and iron. So you'll find iron, nickel, and also some stones uh, inclusions, okay? Or different okay, minerals you. have different well, colors. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, any uh, any more questions, please? Um, can I ask you? Uh, this is Dr. Daniel. Uh, please, Dr. Daniel. Uh, yeah, and I, I think uh, also Miss uh, Salma is, is a is geologist, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember you. Okay, yes. uh, nice presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. My pleasure. Um, I don't know. I maybe you said that, but maybe I, I missed it also from the other presentation. Do you have also a thin section uh, laboratory? You produce your own thin section, or you order the thin sections from outside in order to see them in the microscope? Uh, no, we have our own. We have our own. You know, if you shall one day visit us, because I know you are in the physics department, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are so welcome. You yeah. You also have a lab where you're cutting the rocks and you produce yes. the thin section. Yes, yes, okay. doctor. We have everything there. So inshallah, you are welcome to visit us there yes. and uh, see that, everything. That is, that is very nice. Also, the, the, the nice colors that you're showing in this uh, slide here are, yeah. are, are very nice. And, and, and just to um, add in the discussion uh, that uh, you had with the previous, these nice colors, you can see them also uh in in regular stones rocks on on, on earth and i assume that's why it's, it's called stony meteorite because it has yes. these nice colors uh which are which are common in in uh, in the ordinary rocks and, yes. and the colors are coming the interaction of light with, uh, with the, the minerals so uh, great thank you welcome thank doctor you thank you so much respect. thank you Thank you, Dr. Daniel, for this uh, question. Yes, please go ahead, ask, please. Uh, can you please briefly explain how each one of the analyzer uh, dif uh, is different from the other? Um, okay, briefly, I will say it. Regarding the, you mean the primary tests? Okay, let's go for the this. XRF you know, and the XR at handheld. Okay, so every, everyone is different, you know, as I told you, we start with the primary test, as I mentioned in the slide, okay, for the, um, for the first one, let me go, if you want me to go for the slide, or let me just say it like this, okay, for the first one, we are checking the trace, you know, uh, or the streak test, we are scratching the sample on a ceramic tile, and we will see if it leaves a trace or not, because this is a very good sign. If you know uh, it, leaves a, it leaves a trace, then it could be an earth rock, a terrestrial rock. Uh, that's why there is always confusion between the earth rock and the meteorites, okay? Uh, some earth rocks like hematite and magnetite are leaving trace, traces, you know, color traces, uh, like gray trace or, you know, uh, gray to black trace. So it means that it is not a meteorite. For the magnetism, most of the meteorites are attracted to the magnets, to the magnet. And for the uh, weight, okay, for the weight, it is very important also to check the weight because as I told you, most of the meteorites are heavier than the earth rocks. Uh, regarding the fusion crust, the thin coating layer, which was formed on the outside, okay, of the rock when it enters the atmosphere uh, and burn up. Uh, this is also a good sign, but sometimes, you know, we cannot find this um, coating layer or this fusion crust because, you know, um, maybe we'll find our meteorite, uh, it was staying for a long time in the desert, so it will be weathered or something, then 
uh, we have to check all this. Uh, and then the window test, of course, uh, when you have any sample, you have to check what's inside the rock. So we cut the sample, okay, and check what are inside, what are inside it, okay? Uh, the outside is completely different from inside, uh, especially in the meteorites. Uh, some air strokes, if you cut the, out, the, the inside from the outside, then maybe you'll find the same. So we have to check all this, okay? For the XRF, as I told you, we are having, you know, we are getting the elemental composition of the rock and the percentage also, okay? Uh, and for the XRD, the same also, we are getting uh, the uh, mineral composition. So we are having all these analysis, then uh, we uh, found at least our answer that it is a meteorite or not. Uh, thank you very much, Sanma, for this explanation, and hopefully uh, it is clear. Uh, so we go now to our next uh, next speaker. So uh, Mr. Mohammed Talafha is going to talk explicitly about the UAE Meteor Monitoring Network as sponsored by the UAE Space Agency. So please, Mohammed, take the stage. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, good morning, uh, all. Uh, uh, today, uh, I will make my presentation a little bit uh, short. I hope you see my screen now. Uh, here, it's for the screen. Uh, uh, this uh, UAA Meteorum Monitoring Network, I'm Mohammed Talafha, uh, part of uh, this uh, project funded by uh, UAA Space Agency. Um, uh, this project, I will talk uh, uh, briefly and focus on uh, the, uh, the towers, uh, building, and the instrument, which instrument we use. Uh, this, I will leave you just one minute here. Uh, in this video, one of the uh, towers in Liwa, how we build the, this uh, tower, uh, uh, part of this time, uh, as usual, we have to uh, put something astronomical. You can uh, see this moon uh, behind the tower. This is time lapse. Uh, you can see how um, uh, much the uh, effort here. Uh, and um, uh, day and night, we build these uh, three towers. Um, uh, this tower, I will I'll, uh, go to the next slide. And now, as uh, my colleague Aisha uh, uh, said, we have uh, choose uh, three sites in UAA. This uh, chosen is not uh, uh, just chosen in, 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 in the places. We uh, make something called site selection. Site selection, we have uh, some uh, condition to build uh, these three towers because we have three towers ready. We, uh, uh, our decision to, uh, first decision to build these three towers. We have to build these three towers with one important condition, a scientific condition to uh, cover, first to cover most of um, uh, UAE uh, area uh, and sky. Uh, second thing and important to make some overlapping observation between uh, these three uh, towers. Um, we start with the first uh, tower in uh, here in Sharjah in our uh, academy. Second one here in Liwa, uh, with uh, very far uh, uh, distance between them, and we're looking for somewhere between them. Uh, I will uh, go to the next. This is uh, uh, how we um, the location of uh, all these uh, towers. The distance between uh, Sast and Liwa towers uh, uh, three, uh, 300 kilometers. We're looking between uh, these uh, two towers uh, about uh, one side. Uh, it's uh, good for um, make overlapping between these uh, towers. Just uh, make uh, this in your mind, uh, we need uh, uh, not just lo good location, uh, just good locations depend on uh, uh, electricity, uh, uh, road access, uh, internet, everything. This is not easy selection. Now, thank God we have this three and we have a partner, they help us uh, a lot. Uh, to choose this uh, site. Now everything is uh, operational, uh, working uh, very well. Uh, uh, the, the distance is important for analysis and calculation uh, to know exactly how much we can make overlapping between them. 
221 kilometers between Al Ain and uh, Liwa, 300 between uh, Sest and Liwa, 116 uh, between Al Ain and uh, uh, Sest. Uh, this uh, uh, the area covered in the left uh, hand side. This uh, image by uh, uh, Radwan Ferdini in SDK. This is a, a very good software to uh, make a simulation for our detection for each camera uh, uh, the direction to the sky. Uh, by simply in, in right uh, hand uh, side image, uh, you can see almost these circles with the uh, diameter uh, 200 kilometer to make some uh, simple uh, uh, simulation about uh, how much we can make overlap, uh, uh, overlap observation. Uh, as you know, the, the closest one between uh, SAST and uh, Al Ain make uh, larger. Uh, here, here in the in the center of all this uh, uh, overlapping observation, uh, sometimes we detect triple detection and uh, the important important scientific observation to get uh, a double detection. Well, let's, uh, my colleague Maryam will talking about uh, how we can generate this orbit and uh, so on. Um, uh, the cameras. Now, I don't talk about the instrument, the real instrument, important instrument about these uh, towers. Uh, each tower, each tower has 17 camera. 16 of them, it's, uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hamid mentioned, about six millimeter and eight millimeter. One of them is all sky camera in the center. Here, if you uh, see the, the center uh, uh, image, uh, middle image here in the center, it's uh, all sky camera. And all these 16 uh, covered more than 80% more than of the sky we can. Uh, in the left, uh, this is a sketch about uh, the, the tower, five meter height. Uh, we, in, in this area, in this uh, small room, we have a computer. Uh, attached to all these cameras and recording uh, from uh, starting from uh, sunset to sunrise. Uh, and this is on the left, uh, how it looks like the, our camera. You can see here small numbers. This is very important again, uh, two, 212.6. It's the azimuth of each uh, camera, uh, the, the direction of each camera to know exactly uh, where is this uh, camera in the sky. Uh, about uh, camera, our, our camera uh, always, uh, you, we have thousands of uh, type of cameras and CCD. It's depending on our purpose. Our huge purpose to awareness, to observe and record everything in the sky, everything man-made or natural uh, 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 debris. But uh, for, for uh, again, we have another purpose to observe the meteors meteors that uh, uh, just uh, uh, burning or uh, flashing in our sky. This uh, camera can uh, take this uh, 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 recording very clear with this uh, 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 the properties of this camera. Here, uh, it's very good uh, sketch for uh, each camera as a, a square. Uh, the red one, it's uh, eight millimeter, uh, uh, blue, uh, square is uh, six millimeter and each this is about each uh, tower how much there is overlapping between these uh, these cameras sometimes we observe a meteor by two or sometimes by three uh, cameras that give us more power for analysis for this uh, meteor uh, uh, always we observe above 20 25 uh, degrees uh, from horizon uh, because uh, there is many, many uh, problems to observe in very low uh, uh, altitude. Uh, what, what happened? Okay, we observe, we record. The, the, uh, Ms. Aisha uh, mentioned about we have a, a sophisticated uh, uh, software. Uh, it's uh, working automatically to observe and record any different bright moving. In, in different uh, brightness moving in the sky at night. Uh, okay, we have recorded, uh, all this recorded, uh, our team uh, work um, 24 hours, if we can say, uh, to uh, uh, next step filtration about all these, uh, we have um, wrong uh, videos or detection 
sometimes satellite, uh, sometimes uh, some uh, noise. Uh, it's recorded. We filter it and again uh, hold it or upload it in our uh, our uh, capability uh, cloud. Um, okay. After after uh, uh, we analyze uh, we uh, filtering now after filtering everything happened to analysis. Uh, there is uh, some kind of analysis about uh, to detect and uh, calculate uh, how much we have double detection and triple detection and start uh, analysis. This is uh, one camera, not uh, all cameras. Uh, each uh, image is about one camera uh, uh, stacking image by uh, uh, sometime one week or two weeks. Uh, uh, look each direction, each area in the sky, uh, every two weeks, how much can uh, uh, detect or uh, uh, coming uh, meteor in each? Uh, it's depend sometimes in uh, meteor shower. It's uh, sometimes a spor sporadic. Uh, this is how we uh, look. This is our team uh, from beginning. Some of them uh, student uh, stay with us uh, six months. Sometimes still with us as a student. Uh, always uh, that team working is uh, success. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is the end of my uh, lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Talafha. So we thank you for this nice presentation to present uh, the towers. Uh, let me open the floor to, uh, to questions. Please, if you have any questions, please. Okay, so let me let me add one point here. So for, for as Mohammed said, mm -hmm. uh, for the extension, so we are and also as Aisha said, we are adding uh, hopefully uh, three towers to cover the extreme west, the extreme east, and this will uh, complement uh, what we have as three towers. Uh, as here, the, 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 the uh, map you can uh, yes as the map is showing. So we would like to cover 100% of the UE sky. We are missing a, a part near the. Uh, uh, Western uh, uh, Saudi Arabian uh, boundaries, and uh, also one in the Upper East. Uh, so hopefully, uh, if the project if uh, is accepted by the U.S. agency, we're going to start working on it uh, once uh, this pandemic uh, uh, eases a little bit. Uh, any other question, please? Uh, how do you go about uh, searching for the meteorites? You can spot, uh, of course, like uh, in which direction they have been, but it could be anywhere. Yeah. Right? Uh, so uh, it's you, hundreds of kilometers. You mean meteorite? Yeah. Meteorite after falling, for example, or meteors? Oh, uh, maybe I'm not clear uh, hearing you. About meteorite. Meteorite, okay. It's depend in our these towers. These towers can give us a good orientation and a good analysis for this uh, meteor in the beginning and meteor in the sky, uh, and we can uh, know exactly the direction. Uh, after that, we have another uh, solution for um, uh, following uh, these small uh, rocks. And where is it, uh, where it is uh, falling? We can calculate that at least in five kilometers square. We can uh, looking in that area to find. This is the best way in all over the world. They calculate and they go to the field to find this meteorite. Thank you very much, Mohammed, uh, for this presentation. So we go to the next one. Uh, so we heard about uh, building the towers. We heard about uh, the uh, the locations. Uh, we heard about uh, uh, one more question. Please, please go ahead. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, let's say one of the towers, uh, you know, catches uh, one of the meteors. Okay, so if if it spots that meteor, is it? 
that we will find that meteor landing within that uh, radius of that tower if it's yeah. off, if let's uh -oh. say Leva spots something so we will find it within the that radius of Leva tower or yeah. it could be somewhere else thank you this uh, radius is about uh, detection of the camera the camera can detect uh, almost 150 kilometers, sometimes reach to 200 kilometers far away. This meteor, meteor in the sky, we can detect it in 200 kilometers. Sometimes, if, if because this falling meteorite, uh, um, it's very real. That means maybe every one or two years, maybe more we can uh, detect one of these very fireball brights. That means we can calculate, we know there is some meteorite falling. Uh, uh, now, after calculation, sometimes it's falling in other countries, sometimes it's falling in, in the, the sea. Uh, it's dependent on our calculation, it's geometric calculation to know exactly where is the uh, uh, path, path of this meteor uh, uh, and uh, uh, hit the ground where this is uh, depend in, in, in uh, calculation always. Okay, so the circle is only for what area it can uh, the, the tower can cover, right? Uh, as a video, I will uh, open again my uh, uh, my uh, presentation, please. Sorry, here uh, you see. You mean this uh, circle? Yes. Okay. This circus is uh, in the, the right hand. It's uh, we um, draw it uh, in the uh, experimental way. What the mean experimental way? We always find uh, these towers recording in the sky. This some meteor, sometimes very far, at least 100 kilometer, 200 kilometer. We make an average to make these circles to know uh, uh, how much is, uh, there is overlapping to observe between two towers, Liwa and uh, Ain or Al Ain or... Uh, but it's not uh, uh, depend on where is it falling. It's not depend uh, that the meteorite uh, will be falling in here or there. No, no, uh, because sometimes it's just uh, moving in, in this area. I, I just uh, in my uh, mouse here, in this area and detect by an ion and liwa, but it's falling here in the quarter desert here. This is uh, depending on the direction of it. Great, thank you very much, uh, Talab well. Hawigan. Uh, as, as I was saying, so we went through uh, uh, meteorite analysis, uh, observation towers, cameras, uh, uh, what are the different units of the uh, meteorite center. Now let's go to our last uh, lecture. Uh, don't forget uh, that we have a contest and uh, three of you are going to win telescopes, if for sure, if you do answer right. Okay, so let's go to the last lecture uh, by uh, Ms. Maryam Isa Sharif. She is part of the meteorite center. And she does the meteors analysis. So please, uh, Maryam, take stage. Yes, thank you very much, uh, doctor. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Maryam Sharif, a research assistant at the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences, and Technology at the Meteorite Center. And today I will be presenting about the meteors analysis and how we do it at our center. So starting with the, uh, the outline, uh, we'll start with the network timeline and statistics about the UAE uh, MMN uh, units, as my colleagues have earlier uh, mentioned about it. So here we will talk about the timeline and the statistics. And then following up uh, with the UFO programs, uh, these are the programs are used for uh, the meteor analysis, the UFO capture, UFO analyzer, and UFO orbit. And finally, we'll have some examples on uh, some of our meteor analysis. So as you can see here, uh, you have the timeline. Uh, uh, the, the stations or the towers uh, have been built and operated at a different uh, time. So we don't have all of them uh, in, in operation at once. So first of all, we had the Sharjah station, as you can see here, on the 5th of September uh, on, on 2018. 
and then followed uh, by Liwa Station on the 27th of September 2018. That's all for 2018. And uh, by the beginning of 2019, on 21st of January, we had Ali Hair Station. Uh, following up uh, with the network statistics, uh, as you can see here, uh, the graph that shows uh, the timeline uh, uh, with the months and the years and the quantities uh, on uh, co the quantities of meteors have been observed and captured uh, by each month in each tower. So as you can see, uh, the blue one represents uh, the Sharjah station and the green one is al Yahar and the red one is Liwa. So in total, we have captured uh, about 22,649 meteors, including 2,696 uh, double detection and 260 triple detections. The double and triple detections are uh, essential and important for further uh, meteor analysis. And what we mean by double and triple detection is that the double detection, you have the same meteor that have been observed and captured by two stations. And for the triple detection is that the same meteor have been observed and captured by the three uh, stations. So as you can see here, uh, uh, the numbers goes up and down, and that uh, depends uh, on uh, the meteor activity. If we have a meteor shower, or uh, uh, depends on uh, the weather conditions. If we have cloud skies, it affects our observation, so we don't really observe uh, the meteors uh, as in a clearer uh, weather uh, situation. Also, the moon phase affects our observation. So, for example, if we have a full moon, uh, the brightness uh, of the full moon affects uh, the uh, the availability to to observe uh, uh, the meteors. So uh, we'll move on uh, the programs that we use uh, for our analysis. We have the UFO programs uh, done by Suno Taco. Uh, we have the UFO capture, UFO analyzer, and UFO orbit. So starting with UFO capture, we used to capture our meteors by the towers. So uh, after uh, we captured the meteors, we have like an output of four different files. These files use as an input to the UFO analyzer to do the analysis. Uh, the four files, as, uh, as you can see here, we have an AVI file, it's like a video file. And then we have an XML, uh, it's like a text file. The BMP and JPG are uh, two different uh, uh, formats of photos, that all of these files, uh, we have them for each single uh, meteor that have been captured. So we take all of these files and we have, we use to input it into the UFO analyzer to do our analysis. And then as an output, we get an MCSV uh, file that we use it as an input to the UFO orbit uh, program. So as you can see here, uh, how the uh, the window uh, looks like in the UFO capture uh, program. Uh, we, here we can uh, set up all of our parameters and our inputs uh, to enable the cameras to detect uh, the meteors uh, in the sky. Uh, so uh, as you can see here, uh, you can uh, just click on preview to see a live uh, video uh, that uh, uh, of the of the sky in front of each and every camera. So that's for the UFO capture. And UFO analyzer is the uh, second uh, uh, program that we have that we use to input all of the files that we get uh, the, that we get it from the UFO uh, capture, and we use to add it uh, in this sheet as you can see here and we can set all of our parameters in the profile analyze sheet such as um, the uh, such as the uh, the location uh, for each tower as you can see the coordinates of each uh, and every single um, uh, tower or station for example the latitude and longitude as well as the camera specification such as the LT azimuth and the field of view of each and every camera. And then we press on analyze also analyze. Uh, so the, the program runs out all of the algorithms to do the analysis. And then we uh, click on the MCSV file to get the file to uh, input it into the UFO orbit. 
as you can see here. Uh, so uh, we read the file and then we can specify our operation mode. Uh, if you want it uh, as a single station or pair or unified uh, radiant. And then uh, we have, uh, as you can see here, different sheets. We have the quality and the stream sheet. So for the quality sheets, uh, as you can see, we have different quality levels. It started from Q0 to Q3, Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3. For Q0 is uh, with the minimum uh, uh, restrictions, you can say, or the, with the minimum uh, constraints. Uh, so, and then uh, once you move on, on the upper uh, or the higher uh, quality level, uh, the constraints uh, used to increase. So we have more constraints on the higher uh, level to give us uh, a more accurate uh, result. So as you can see, here we have different uh, results or different maps. Uh, so in Q0, we have more, uh, 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 more uh, observations, you can see. And then Q1, we have less. And in Q2, we have even uh, less. And then Q3, sometimes uh, we can't really have anything inside it. That's for the quality sheet. For the stream sheet, uh, we have, uh, as you can see here, uh, how does it uh, look like? So it shows us uh, the meteor groups uh, of our observations, our file that we have, uh, uh, we have read uh, that our files. So we have, uh, for example, here, uh, if we have sporadic meteor, which is uh, a meteor that they don't belong to any meteor shower, we call them sporadic meteor, or we have, uh, uh, within uh, specific uh, meteor showers. So as you can see here for the Perseids meteor shower or Ita Eridanas uh, meteor shower, and also shows us the count. So in each uh, meteor group, how many we have in each, uh, uh, how many meteors we have in each meteor group. So that's for the stream sheet. And as an output, uh, the UFO orbit provides us with four different maps. For example, here we have the radiant map, which shows the radiant point of each meteor uh, within its uh, meteor group. So we have uh, different uh, colors for each uh, uh, meteor, uh, I mean, uh, the radiant of each meteor, which uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the color code are uh, to, just to specify and to show uh, the speed of that uh, meteor so we can know uh, each specific meteor, uh, the these uh, which with a specific speed, and then uh, we have another uh, map, as you can see here, the trail map, which shows the trail of the meteors on the star chart. Here we have the ground map, which shows uh, where the meteor have been observed by each tower. So, for example, this uh, for uh, this is the Liwa Tower. So it show uh, it's uh, have been observed the meteor from this point till this point. So we have uh, an, an idea from uh, this map where uh, the meteor had been observed. And in the orbit map, it shows us uh, the orbit of each and every meteor uh, in the solar system, as you can see here. So here we have the sun in yellow, as it shows in yellow points. And here are uh, the other, uh, uh, the, the orbit planet, uh, the planet's orbits. So here we have the earth in blue. And you can see uh, each uh, meteor uh, orbit uh, uh, in, the, in the solar system. So you have an idea about the orbit that have uh, this meteor uh, took until it reached to our planet. So uh, here we have uh, some uh, examples of our meteor analysis. Uh, we either uh, have like uh, we do the analysis for a single or for a group uh, of uh, meteors. So for a single, for example, here we have uh, for a specific fireball. Here is an example of uh, a fireball that have been captured by two uh, of our stations, Liwa and Al-Yahar, on the 1st of August 2019, around uh, 10 p.m. This is uh, from... Uh, uh, this is from Liwa, and as you can see, it was closer to Liwa, and this is from al -Yahar. So th uh, these two uh, uh, from al uh, this is by one of the camera, and this is by the, another one, uh, the other camera. So it shows the full meteor that have been covered by these two cameras. And uh, we can have uh, a meteor analysis uh, that we analyze a specific period. For example, here we have from the 17th of July 2019 till the 23rd of August 2019. So we'll start with the fireball that we have captured. So after the uh, analysis, uh, 
uh, have done. Uh, it shows that this uh, specific fireball uh, is uh, with an apparent magnitude of minus 4.4, which is a bright one. And here, as you can see, uh, the resulted ground map uh, from where uh, the towers have been observed uh, this meteor, uh, I mean, this fireball. So after uh, this, we can do uh, further uh, uh, analysis, you can say, uh, some calculations, as my colleague, Mr. Uh, Talafha earlier uh, mentioned, that we can do some calculation here uh, to somehow uh, uh, to approximate uh, the possible uh, landing location of uh, that specific fireball. And here we have uh, a result uh, from the orbit map, which shows us the orbit of this specific fireball as uh, it have been uh, took to. So, and here uh, we have uh, the, uh, an the analysis results for this specific period. As you can see here, uh, for uh, these different uh, meteor groups. And these analysis have been done under the quality uh, level of the Q2, which is somehow you can say a high quality level. So it shows that we have 25 of sporadic meteors, nine of alpha uh, Capricornides, and four of Perseids. So uh, as you can see here, uh, the radiant map, so for the sporadic, as you can see, uh, they are separated, I mean, uh, distributed all over. Uh, they don't follow a specific uh, group, but uh, for the Capricornites, you can see them here. And for the Perseids, you can see them here. So that's for the radiant map. For the following map, we have the trail map. So for each meteor group, we have uh, the resulted uh, trail map for the sporadic. And here we have for alpha Capricornites. And here we have for Perseids. That's for the trail map, it shows the trail of each meteor in each within each group. Here is, uh, we have some examples of the ground map. We have the sporadic, as well as the uh, alpha capricornis and the Perseids, as you can see. And here, uh, finally, we have the orbit map, uh, again, for the each uh, specific meteor group, as you can see for the sporadic alpha capricornis, you can see it here, and for Perseids as you can see um, here. So basically uh, that's uh, all about uh, the meteor uh, analysis uh, presentation. So thank you all for your time and thank you for listening. So if you have any uh, further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mariam, for this extens extensive explanation of the uh, how do you do the meteor analysis. Uh, please, uh, any questions? Uh, is it possible when we look at a meteor uh, to say, to define from which group it had come from? Is that possible? Yes, so after we capture, we have uh, to uh, input it to the programs that I have earlier uh, mentioned. So after uh, the analysis, then uh, we can see uh, and uh, to define from which meteor group, but just observing it and uh, in the sky, uh, it's a bit harder to uh, determine from which meteor group it would be. Uh, there's a question here, uh, Mr. Ahmed said, I wanted to ask when exporting the capture the footage, is there a reason not to use PNG format? Uh, these formats are, uh, uh, like, as you can see, uh, that what we can use to input it to our uh, UFO analyzer uh, program or software. So uh, to, to if you want to analyze it using that uh, software, we need it into these uh, four different formats. It's uh, essential to have them as these formats. Otherwise, the, the program will not be able to analyze uh, this meteor. So it is because of the uh, of the program of the software. Yes, exactly. Great. Uh, any other question, please? Yes, yeah, Dr. Elias, I have a, this is Diego Rodriguez here, and I have a, a question. So, Miss Miss Marian, on these orbit groups that you're you're analyzing, are are they being uh, somehow monitored by your telescope, so that maybe in the future you you could be predicting when such um, such meteorites could be coming into Earth? Yes, yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, what we do uh, right now is that we just uh, analyze it 
after uh, it passed uh, by our uh, sky. So for future, we might like develop, uh, uh, you can say a database, like based on what we have now and to do some, like you can say simulations uh, to uh, further like uh, detect or uh, uh, like expect uh, the coming a meteor, like from which orbit they might uh, pass by, but uh, that's uh, for the current moment we don't do such a thing uh, here. Okay, so it, it could be interesting to put the, those orbits in and put analyze the sun phasing angle and then cue um, the some of the telescopes into those orbits to see if if they could pose a threat to to the Earth in the near future. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm. I, believe, I believe STK would be very useful in this sense, you know. Yes, it would. It would. Um, excuse Any me. Any other question, please? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Ms. Mariam, for this first presentation. I just would like to ask um, for, uh, where, uh, when is the time of the year where you like expect to have the most activity and also what are the future kinds of research that you will do uh, when analyzing like the videos that that are captured by the towers yes uh, so uh, for example as uh, uh, the first uh, of your first question I believe if I can share my, uh, my slides I believe I'm not showing this. I'm sorry for that. That's not the one. I think I lost. Um, yes, here. Uh, so, uh, for uh, example, uh, when we do expect uh, uh, the most uh, meteor observation, it depends on the meteor showers. So, for example, as you can see here in 2018, uh, on December, uh, we have the highest uh, observations. Uh, based on uh, that, because in December we have the Gemini uh, meteor uh, shower, uh, which uh, it is uh, well known of its uh, high rate, uh, but fine meteors. So that's on 2018. But as you can see, if we compare it to, to December uh, 2019, uh, uh, no, we don't have that much of observation, and that's because of the effect of the full moon. So if you want, uh, uh, like to expect when we have like the highest uh, meteor observation, we just follow up uh, the meteor shower uh, table and to see uh, the dates with uh, the maximum uh, or with the peak uh, of each uh, meteor shower. I hope that's answered your uh, question. So is it okay now? Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Maria. You're welcome. Uh, if I may add something, uh, meteor showers, uh, the rate are very difficult to to, to, um, uh, to set. So it all depends. As Maryam said, it depends upon the, uh, first of all, the meteor shower itself. Some of them are very rich. Some of them are very, uh, are very poor. Uh, the phase of the moon is very important if it is full moon, so it will uh, just ruin your observation. Uh, and uh, those space debris that cause uh, these meteors are not uh, uniformly distributed, meaning that in one year you may have a rich meteor shower for the Gemini, and the next year it's full. So we just gave a number, so it may be it may be good to see this year, it may be very bad next year. So. Uh, it is not exact science, but we have a system to observe them all the time. Okay, any more questions before we uh, we move on? I believe for those who, who, who attended, they were following carefully because we're going to ask questions. Okay, so uh, uh, I believe uh, we have uh, we have maybe just uh, two or three minutes uh, to get ready for the contest. Uh, I will ask uh, Aisha, 
I believe she is ready. She is just waiting. I have asked Aisha, Maryam, Selma, Thuria uh, to think of something to, for this contest. And they came up with uh, some nice and easy questions, I believe, uh, and also with nice proposition to, uh, for, as, a, as a gift. Uh, so uh, I believe uh, how will it uh, how will it uh, happen? So I will leave the stage to Aisha. If you do, please. If you do answer, uh, if you, if you do answer right, you don't have to answer another time. So give a chance to other to other people. If you do answer right and uh, you are declared the winner, we need your name, okay, the full name. Uh, and uh, once you have your full name, so take uh, take my email address. This is very important. Once uh, you have uh, you have my email address, I will uh, uh, email me, and I need your address and your gift. Your gift will be shipped directly to your location. Uh, it will be uh, hopefully it will be a very happy gift because uh, it will open for you the sky. Okay. Uh, so good luck uh, for all of you. Uh, so. Uh, First come, first served, and uh, let me uh, leave the floor to uh, to Miss Aisha uh, for the contest. Aisha, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I just want to tell the audience that uh, you have to answer using the chat box, and the first to answer is the winner. Okay, so the first question is, what so, was the so, first? So, uh, just Aisha, wait. So is it is it clear? So your answers is not audio. So you have to write, the, uh, write your answer on the chat message. Is it clear? Clear. Go. So the first question is, what was the first asteroid to be discovered? Who discovered it and when? So how much time do you give them? About a minute or two. Yes, and uh, you are correct. So we have our first winner. Hind uh, answered before Ahmad, so Hind is the winner. Now we will move on to the second question. Oh, just one minute, Aisha. Uh, Hind, uh, I did uh, write my email in the chat, so please email me, okay, to get your address. Is it clear? Hind. Great, go ahead. Okay, the second question, in which layer of the Earth's atmosphere do meteors burn up? Yes, Imad, you are correct, mesosphere. So the second winner is Imad. Great, Imad again. I don't know if Imad is he or she, I don't know. Whatever, he. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. So please, uh, you have my email. Send me your address, okay? Using your email and my email. Great. Okay, the last question. Okay, last question. What is the difference between a meteor and a meteorite? Okay, be more specific, guys. Okay, so the first complete answer uh, was by Madiha, I believe. Correct me, my colleagues. Meteor is in space. Meteorite is in when it's land. I think Madiha got it right. Uh, there was a student, however, he or she answered in two different messages. So this makes Madiha the winner. Okay, great. So we have three winners. We have Hind. We have... Uh, uh... I forgot the third, the second one. Remind Hind, me, Aisha. Hind, Imad, and Madiha. Hind, Imad, and Madiha. So please, you three, you know my email. Uh, I need to, you, to have your address, your mobile numbers. Okay, send me that by email, and your gift. Hopefully, we reach you within 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 a week. So congratulations. So it was a very rapid, uh, very rapid uh, contest, mashallah. So I thank Aisha for these uh, beautiful questions. Okay, so I believe I have to conclude uh, for this uh, Ice Day uh, celebration. 
Uh, I would like to thank you all for your participation. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Hamid uh, for uh, uh, giving us a couple of minutes uh, of his very precious time uh, to give us uh, uh, a, brief, a brief introduction to this Asteroid Day. Uh, its meaning, uh, its, uh, its setting by the United Nations, uh, also what SAS is doing now in terms of research, and also, and also the great support of His Highness uh, to what we do at the Academy. Uh, so it was great. Uh, uh, Dr. Antonios gave us uh, uh, also a very nice lecture about space debris. Usually I am a little bit confused because he said debris is a French word. Debris. I, uh, I speak French. And sometimes why I'm confused because sometimes when you say uh, space debris, is it uh, singular or is it plural? So what do you think? What happens? No answer. Okay, so so so, so it was a very nice uh, talk by uh, Dr. Turns about space debris, what are they, and so on, and how do they uh, pose a threat, uh, even 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 if it is uh, uh, as big as one centimeter, if it like the uh, the ISS, the International Space Station, to be a big uh, a big. A big problem. Uh, then Aisha went to the Petrolite Center. She talked about uh, what we have as units in it. We have the machine learning, we have the observation, the analysis. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, Selma went into the meteorite analysis. How do we analyze uh, these rocks once we have them? Uh, we do a lot here at, uh, at, uh, at the Academy. So we do receive a lot of, of these rocks uh, from people here and there. I believe up to now we have maybe more than uh, 50 analysis. Uh, of this, so we do the partial ones at the academy, and the uh, the uh, the uh, the sophisticated one we use uh, the uh, the University of Sharjah Advanced Science Material Lab to do the analysis. We have uh, uh, plenty plenty of machines to do that. Uh, we also Alaf had talked about uh, the UE MMM, the UE uh, Meteor Monitor Network, in terms of the towers, the location, the cameras, and also. The future expansion of the UMM, so we may add three, uh, three more stations uh, uh, to complete uh, to have one percent sky coverage. Uh, Maryam came and she talked about the video analysis, how we do, how we collect the data and how we do the analysis. It is, believe it or not, it is a very deep work. It does take a lot of time, uh, and uh, we have to thank the whole group. Uh, uh, Maryam uh, also used. Uh, in doing uh, this analysis for us. And uh, the end result is uh, this beautiful uh, histogram that we do obtain up to now. Uh, we have observed more than 22,000 of this. Uh, of this, uh, of this uh, let me, I don't know why I'm switching off my video. So now you can see me because I am wearing a very nice uh, tie with planets, with the uh, asteroid, with rockets, and you need to see it. Okay. so. Uh, then the contest. So we thank those people who have won these uh, three prizes, and hopefully uh, it will be sent. It will be sent to them. Okay. So uh, this is it. So let me thank all of you, students, uh, uh, general interested people, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, two and a half hours. What is good about it? Do you know besides all the information that uh, that that you got uh, about? Uh, space debris, but what we do here at the Metro Center. What is good about it, and, it, and we have to thank, uh, don't, don't understand me wrong, huh? we have to thank the pandemic for, for, for this, that uh, we are saving a lot of money for the university. No coffee breaks, no food, nothing. Do it online, everything is fine to keep safe, inshallah. I believe this is, uh, this is, uh, this is very nice. I believe the university is pleased of having all, all of these meetings, no no hotel reservation, no specific whatever catering. So everything has been saved. Good, because that money we need it for the academy. So to be something much better, inshallah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this, uh, for the, for your attendance. Uh, for my student, I took attendance for sure. I asked Arisa to take the attendance and uh, it will be counted as bonus points. I didn't tell them that uh, because otherwise, whatever. So it will be good for them. So again, thank you very much. And also one thing, one thing please. If you have any suggestion how we do things much better than we did today, or if you have, if you'd like to propose 
uh, to run, let's say, uh, specific workshops like this one. Uh, this coming summer, summer will be long. So please, please drop us a line, send us an email, and we try to do our best to do it. Uh, we have uh, today we have emphasized only on the meteorite center, but don't forget that we have the radio astronomy lab. Uh, we have uh, we have the space weather lab. Uh, we have uh, the CubeSat lab. Uh, we are working hopefully on this artificial intelligence lab. So uh, the data center. So we'd like uh, to have uh, uh, to have uh, suggestions or how to do things better in the future. How to get more students, more of you working with us uh, as much as possible. So we need uh, we need to, we, we need to work out to this in the future. So please, if you have any suggestion, you can send it to me. You can say to Thuria, our uh, our lab secretary. You can say to any one of us, to Aisha, to Maryam, to Talafha, to Isam, to, 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 to Selma, and we'll do our best, 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 best to, 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 to at least to fulfill our duties here. Uh, as, uh, there's a question here, do future students count in the bonus mark too? Yes, 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 yes. I will, I will mark your name. If I know that tomorrow, I will, I will give you a point, inshallah. Do you guys implore? Yes, we do. Uh, if you have a good CV, send it to us, inshallah. We'll do our best to have you in our rank. Yes, we do. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question. Why, why did I lose in the last question when I answered the first? I have no idea. Because okay. you did not answer in one full uh, message. Oh, yes, you did not answer in one full message. But, uh, that's fine. It's just a simple question. Next time we'll we'll give you a gift, inshallah. Send me your send me your 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 coordinates. Okay. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, very much, and uh, we'll see you in the next workshop. Okay. So bye bye. Assalamu alaikum.